The Hoover Institution is the nation's preeminent research center dedicated to generating policy ideas that promote economic prosperity, national security, and democratic governance. Hoover research has directly led to policies that have produced greater opportunity and freedom in the United States and the world. How has Hoover achieved this distinction? By assembling an extraordinary fellowship of policy-oriented academics and scholarly practitioners, by offering open access to a world-renowned library and archives, and by resolutely focusing on ideas that define a free society. Herbert Hoover is the founder of the institution that bears his name. After graduating in Stanford's pioneer class in 1895, he became a successful mining engineer, renowned humanitarian, and president of the United States. While administering famine relief to Belgium during World War I and participating in the subsequent Paris Peace Conference, Hoover recognized the importance of collecting historical material that could yield knowledge about preventing a recurrence of the calamities he had witnessed in Europe. In April 1919, he pledged $50,000 to Stanford University to support his war collection. We celebrate this pivotal moment 100 years ago as the founding of what was to become the Hoover Institution. By 1929, Hoover's War Library contained 1.4 million items and had already become the largest in the world focused on the Great War and its aftermath. Collecting expanded to include material related to social, political, and economic change in the 20th century. Hoover Tower was completed in 1941 to house the rapidly growing library and archive. In 1957, the collection was definitively renamed the Hoover Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. Hoover's vision for the institution is captured in a statement to the Stanford Board of Trustees in 1959. The institution supports the Constitution of the United States, its Bill of Rights, and its method of representative government. The overall mission of this institution is, from its records, to recall the voice of experience against the making of war, and by the study of these records and their publication, to recall man's endeavors to make and preserve peace. The institution itself must constantly and dynamically point the road to peace, to personal freedom, and to the safeguards of the American system. By the 1970s, the institution was generating influential research on government regulation, tax policy, national security, health care, social security, energy, and proposals to limit government expenditures. Many innovative public policy proposals developed by Hoover Fellows were adopted in the 1980s, and Hoover contributed influential policy ideas for countering communism that ultimately led to the collapse of the former Soviet Union in 1991. The all-volunteer army, the flat tax, the Taylor rule for monetary policy, and school choice and accountability are all transformative policy ideas generated by Hoover Fellows. Hoover's timeless fundamental values of freedom, private enterprise, and limited effective representative government derive from 100 years of scholarship and the lessons of history. The Hoover Institution is poised for even greater impact in the years ahead informing the marketplace of ideas, advising the country's policymakers, and illuminating the road to prosperity and peace in America and around the world. This lecture series brings together Hoover Fellows to discuss how the ideas and values that have undergirded the institution for 100 years remain crucial in understanding and formulating public policy in the 21st century. The founders of this country thought that citizenship was central both to the exercise of freedoms, which they called in the Constitution the privileges and immunities of citizens, but also of obligations. But those obligations are a deeper and harder matter than we think about today. For, for them, citizens had an obligation to subordinate their own narrow self-interest to the common good of the whole, or they didn't believe free government could uh, survive. Now that's a hard thing, particularly in a diverse country like the United States. And remember, the United States was diverse on racial, ethnic, language, uh, religion, and other lines, uh, even before it was the United States. And it requires certain institutions and practices uh, in order to develop good citizens of this sort. What are 
the institutions? What are the ways we have of forming good citizens in the United States? Democracy is collective self-government by citizens. And because of that, unlike an autocracy, democracy must educate its citizens. It must do that because the citizens must both have reasons to defend their own rights as citizens, and they must have the skills to do that well. Democratic education can have various forms. It can be the moral behavior of democratic leaders. It can be the kind of civics curriculum that has been developed for primary and secondary schools, perhaps less common now than it once was. But I believe what has to happen now in the 21st century is that research universities need to stand up to the challenge of developing a new curriculum for the distinctive challenges that are facing us in the 21st century. Democratic citizens today need to have the skills, they need to have the reasons to use those skills that will enable democracy to take on its future. Without that, democracy is in trouble. The tradition of citizenship in the United States is marked by a continual expansion of rights and responsibilities over the centuries. It's expressed in one way through a set of Supreme Court decisions. Some include the Dred Scott decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, the Loving case, Wong Kim Ark, among others. Those decisions pointed the United States in the direction of including people who had been enslaved or excluded um, as part of the American political um, tradition. In addition to Supreme Court decisions, we have the political system itself. Think about it. We have, in the United States, 51 sovereigns, the federal government and 50 states, each with overlapping responsibility. And we have more elected officials than any country on earth and more elections. You can bet your bottom dollar there's an election going on somewhere in the U.S. and someone becoming an official, a government official, in any given month. It says a lot about citizenship in the U.S. It's not just a right, it's a responsibility. A country can be likened to a bank. If you want to take something out, you have to put something in. A country such as ours, a government of the people, by the people, for the people, if we want to maintain that government, then we're going to have to contribute to our country. If we want freedom, we're going to have to contribute to this country. Our country has a long tradition of citizens serving in our military. And having spent over four decades myself in the military, I've seen citizens and immigrants who want to be citizens serving alongside each other, carrying out those duties. The military has been a touchstone for those citizens and those who wish to be because they have an obligation to the next generation to make certain we turn over these freedoms intact, the ones we enjoy, to the next generation. I look forward to our discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Gilligan. I'm the director of the Hoover Institution. I want to welcome you to this final installment of our centennial speaker series entitled A Century of Ideas for a Free Society that we launched in March 2019 to commemorate the institution's 100 year anniversary. The series has featured 11 panel discussions with 32 Hoover scholars over the course of the year on a wide range of topics and policy ideas that examine central lessons of history in the 20th and 21st centuries. Thanks to the generosity of Hoover donors, we were able to add the Traytail building to the Stanford campus almost two years ago. This wonderful 400-seat Hauk Auditorium has provided a comfortable and centrally located venue to launch our first speaker series to celebrate this important moment in Hoover's history. Based on the sellout crowds at almost every lecture, we think that this series has been a success, so thank you all for your continued participation and interest in, the Hoover, in Hoover scholarship. 
Plans are underway to kick off another speaker series in the spring, so please be on the lookout for forthcoming information. Let me now turn to the matter at hand. Today's discussion is titled, The Crucible of Citizenship, and includes a panel discussion with the following participants. General Jim Mattis is the Davies Family Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution. We are happy to have General Mattis return to Hoover after serving as the nation's 26th Secretary of Defense. General Mattis commanded at multiple levels during his illustrious 43-year career as an infantry Marine. Before retiring in 2013, Jim headed U.S. Central Command, directing military operations of over 200,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Coast Guard Marines and allied forces across the Middle East. He is the author of the recent New York Times bestseller, Call Sign Chaos, Learning to Lead. Joshua Ober is the Constantine Mitsotakis Chair in the School of Humanities and Sciences, specializing in the areas of ancient and modern political theory and historical institutionalism. He has a secondary appointment in the Department of Classics and a courtesy appointment in philosophy. His most re recent book is entitled Demopolis, Democracy Before Liberalism in Theory and Practice, which was published in 2017. His ongoing work focuses on the theory and practice of democracy and the politics of knowledge and innovation. Chiron Skinner is the W. Glenn Campbell Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Talby Professor, Professor of International Relations and Politics and Director of the Institute of Politics and Strategy at Carnegie Mellon University. Prior to her recent return to academia, Chiron served as Director of the Office of Policy Planning and Senior Policy Advisor to the Secretary of State at the U.S. Department of State. Her areas of expertise are international relations and security. And the moderator for today's panel is Michael McConnell, who's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Richard and Francis Mallory Professor and Director of the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School. Michael has served as a circuit judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit, and he has held chaired professorships at the University of Chicago and the University of Utah, as well, in, as, well as visiting professorships at Harvard and NYU. In the past decade, his work has been cited in opinions of the Supreme Court, second most often of any legal scholar. McConnell has argued 15 cases in front of the Supreme Court. He served as a law clerk to Supreme Court Justice William J. Brennan, Jr., and is of counsel to the appellate practice of Kirkland and Ellis. Please join me in welcoming in this esteemed group to the stage. So welcome and thanks for, to uh, this uh, huge crowd for coming out this evening to talk about a subject of considerable, I think, interest and controversy, uh, namely citizenship uh, in the United States. Because you know, from the beginning of the Republic, there's been a problem. How do you form, how do we form uh, a, a citizenry out of such a diverse, eclectic mix of languages, religions, peoples. Uh, and this is especially important, at least our framers believed it was especially important because their understanding was that in a republic, you know, as opposed to a monarchy or other authoritarian regime, it was essential uh, that uh, republican citizens voluntarily, out of their own passion and patriotism, be committed to a much thicker understanding of the common good than is necessary in those other regimes. So it's both more necessary and at the same time uh, more difficult. And then we were lacking some things that these older regimes would have that had been unifying citizen forming institutions. We didn't have a, a monarch uh, whom we would all rally around. We were not going to have a unifying established church we weren't going to have control over the printing press, you know, that brings a kind of 
uh, uh, authoritarian unity uh, to a country. George Washington proposed that we have a national university, but he was repeatedly uh, voted down. Um, some opponents of our Constitution thought that this was the Achilles heel, that this was the, the real problem, that we would not be able to uh, have a successful republic on the scale of the United States when we lacked institutions for the formation of good Republican uh, citizens. And yet here we are, uh, some 235 uh, years later, and it, it turns out we do have some of those institutions. And my uh, colleagues are here, going to be here uh, talking about uh, some of the most important of those, beginning with Chiron Skinner, who's going to give us uh, a more a theoretical account of citizenship and its challenges in this more global era. And then we're going to talk about uh, the military and about education as, uh, as part of the uh, institutions necessary for the crucible of citizenship. So I'll get started. Please. Um, it's great to be back at Hoover. Um, I hope there's some students in the audience um, because I had some assignments, but um, <laughs> I'll just ask the grown-ups um, questions if I have to. Um, the whole idea of citizenship and what motivated my remarks um, in the um, clip that you just saw, um, I think we look at our big court decisions. I don't want to spend too much time on them. I see Richard Epstein's in the audience, and then we've got Professor McConnell here. So. Um, I will stay away from a deep analysis of those cases. Um, I'll point to you, um, sir, if, if there are some questions. But we've defined our citizenship that's been a part of the fabric of who we are. And so the Dred Scott decision is one that I've taught to many of my students who just can't believe at any point in American history um, that the Supreme Court could have declared a person slave or um, in a free or non-free state, not a citizen of the United States. And we start there for that conversation because um, the students that we teach now um, didn't necessarily learn about some of the canonical cases in American history surrounding citizenship. Then you look, think about Plessy versus Ferguson talking about separate but equal. Um, and later, we just chipped away until we came to a fuller understanding of what it means to be American. But in the cases that I mentioned in, um, in the clip and the ones that are most prominent, um, including the one in 1898 about a Chinese American whose archives are in San Bruno, just down the street at the National Archives, where he was decided, um, the court decided that he was a citizen based on its understanding of the 14th Amendment, um, being born in America, even though his parents were not American, um, that he should be given citizenship. There's a racial component that has been part of the fabric of our country when we talk about what it means to be American. And I don't think it's very different um, to this day. But there's another challenge that we're facing that I think is fairly profound. And that is um, from those who believe in the concept of global citizenship. And so I don't like calling or labeling people, but I'll just use globalist in this conversation as a shorthand um, for what I think that they're trying to say. Um, they're looking at their understanding of the empirical reality. The United States has, as I've said, basically 51 sovereigns, 50 states, um, and a federal government with layers of authority under each and much of it inter um, um, overlapping. Um, it's a, the world's most fully functioning multi-ethnic democracy. It's not the largest India is. Um, but for all of this and all of the elections that are held where we're deeply enfranchised and engaged in the US, we still have war, we have crime, we have poverty at the domestic and international level and those who believe in global citizenship argue we need a different approach. And they advocate that um, the idea of global citizenship is a superior way to having citizenship inhere within the nation state. That citizenship should and can take place in multiple sites. And those sites will make it possible for us to capture all of the issues that will bring more people to political freedom and out of 
um, out of poverty. That's a big debate for the United States and I don't think that we're fully prepared for it because we have understood citizenship as part of a political territory and, um, and also um, as in a more Westphalian sense. This idea of global citizenry is about supranational authority above states and saying that people outside of a state who have stakeholders, who see themselves as stakeholders in global responsibility should be able to determine what happens in states of which they are not a member. So they want a different world, basically. And they want to do away with political and territorial boundaries. And they also make some arguments that I think will help us better understand what we're doing in the U US if we stay committed to a more birthright understanding of, of citizenship. For example, they argue that the issue of controlling borders um, entails the use of force. And in, if the use of force is involved, those who are the quote unquote victims of that force, be they US citizens or non-US citizens, both sides should be involved in that discussion and they cite international law um, as a way to determine what border should look like because of the legitimate use of force that nation states have. Um, there are other arguments that they make um, as well. And um, the criticisms I think that are being leveled back are pretty important um, and I'd like to mention some of those. Just suppose that we go with this idea of global citizenship. What does it do to the international system? Because I think the issue of citizenship really now is a, a um, part of a larger discussion of what we want the world to look like. For better or worse, the nation state does much of the work in the international system. It carries the transaction costs that makes commerce possible. Um, it is superior to international organizations and regional organizations in protecting people, providing prosperity, education, and opportunity. Um, and nothing seems to be working better. If we're willing to reconceive of the international system, we have to do it in stages. It can't just be a vision. It has to be grounded in an, in an empirical reality. No one would argue that we have commitments that go beyond um, our borders and that to be a moral liberal democracy, we have responsibility to protect other people both in and outside of the state. But how do we draw those lines? These are deeply, I think, philosophical and theoretical questions, ones that shouldn't be driven by emotion and politics. But then not everyone who addresses these problems um, is an ideologue. Some are looking at the geopolitical realities and realizing that the US cannot go it alone in the world, um, cannot take up much of the responsibility that it did say between 1945 and 1960, um, and that there are many other countries coming along. Also, um, from an, an American standpoint, there, and for those who want the US to be the predominant power on Earth, who want the United States to help buy the international system a couple more generations of, of freedom. Um, there is the concern of the coming power of the global south. Those countries that will define the future, perhaps collectively and some individually, more than China um, and definitely more than Russia. Many of them have a, extreme poverty and would it not be in our strategic interest to find a way um, to bring many of those people into the American enfranchisement system just for our own protection um, and for our own future? These are some of the questions that are being leveled now. I think what President Trump is talking about um, is a very different issue, not about so much global citizenship, but as I mentioned um, to Professor McConnell, I think trying to figure out What's the narrow and wide definition of the citizenship clause in the 14th Amendment? And that, I think, is why we don't have a well-worked out executive order on the very issue that the president has talked about. 
that's a slightly separate matter, but the issue of global citizenship, I think, is one that's particularly urgent because it will help shape the world we're in in the future. So I'd like to begin with um, uh, a quote from Chief Justice Robert, uh, John G. Roberts, um, uh, in his 2019 um, end of year report on the federal judiciary just released um, a month or so ago. Uh, Roberts points out that since the end of the 18th century constitutional era, quote, we have come to take democracy for granted and civic education has fallen by the wayside. In our age, when social media can instantly spread rumor and false information on a grand scale, the public's need to understand our government and the protections it provides is ever more vital. Civic education, like all education, is a continuing enterprise and conversation. Each generation has an obligation to pass on to the next, not only a fully functioning government responsive to the needs of the people, but the tools to understand and improve it. Justice Roberts notes that, quote, Judges from coast to coast have made their courthouses available as forums for civic education, but, he goes on, the federal courts cannot, of course, take on the challenge of civic education alone. Well, I think Chief Justice Roberts is dead right, and I'll go further and say that the shortfall in civic education that we see today is an American crisis, and it threatens the future of our democratic republic. And why is that? It's because, I think as Mike McConnell suggested, democracy is different from autocracy in that democracy is collective self-government by citizens. And that means it's citizens themselves, ourselves, who must pay the costs of sustaining valuable social order. And that in turn means that we must have been offered good reasons to pay those costs. So in Robert's words, quote, the public's need to understand our government and the protections it provides. And in a competitive world, furthermore, citizens must have the skills necessary to carry out the duties of citizenship in a way that is skillful. They have to be able to do it well. Again, in Robert's words, quote, the tools to improve their government. So understanding and improvement imply a grasp of history and tradition. But in the 21st century, we're facing new challenges. Democracy is being challenged in new kinds of ways in America and elsewhere. And what we need, I suggest, is a civic education that is grounded in American traditions, but it's also alive to the unique conditions of our 20th century world. So whose job is this? Who has the responsibility for educating citizens? And I'll offer you three what I think are pretty traditional answers that I think are right. First, the answer that would be offered by anyone living in the civilizations I study primarily, Greece or Rome, um, or for the matter, that matter in 18th century America, the answer they would ask, who is responsible for civic education? Leaders. By their public and private behavior, leaders serve as civic exemplars for good or ill. Because leaders are civic educators, those persons who hold high office must exemplify high ethical standards and political rectitude. When they do not, when they lie or cheat or bully, they teach rising generations that unethical, self-serving behavior is not only acceptable, but desirable. Second, as any American living in the 19th or early 20th century would be likely to say, the responsibility for civic education lies in our primary and secondary schools. Basic courses in civics and American history are needed to teach the nuts and bolts of constitutional order, 
how that order was achieved, how it has been sustained over generations, how it has been challenged, how it's changed. How are we doing on that score? And I'm just going to say bluntly, badly. Only nine states, along with the District of Columbia, currently require a full year of US government or civics courses, while 30 states require half a year. 11 other states have no civics requirement at all. Civics and history, in short, are being grounded out by skills training, not the skills of citizenship, but the skills of the market. The result is that in 2014, for example, only 23% of eighth grade US students reached the proficient standard on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And that proficient standard perhaps is not the standard we might ideally want to hope for. Less than a quarter. Uh, 2016 survey by the Annenberg Public Policy Center found that 26% of Americans can name all three branches of government. That's a significant decline from previous years. So I say we're not doing so well. The third answer to that question of whose duty it is to take on the job of educating citizens is one that any American educator of the mid 20th century would give. And that is advanced education is a primary responsibility of our colleges and universities, the places where our future leaders are being trained. And here, the shortfall is arguably most acute. Stanford, like most other American universities, once had a robust and mandatory civics curriculum. Today, Stanford, like most other American universities, is derelict in its duty to offer its citizens anything like a civic education. We do a terrific job, I think I can say this in all honesty, in training students to be productive members of society in economic terms. We do a miserable job in giving them the understanding and skills that Justice Roberts spoke of. Research universities like Stanford and research institutes like Hoover have the resources, the material and intellectual capital to be leaders in the essential work of designing adv an advanced civic education curriculum for the 21st century. We've not been doing our duty for a long time, and it's past time to take up the slack. A university level civics education can and should go far beyond the nuts and bolts of high school civics into a much greater depth than the set of facts that must be mastered to pass the United States naturalization test. Today, university students need to be able to answer deep questions. What makes the kind of collective action on which democracy depends so difficult? What makes it possible? What are the most relevant historical experiments with citizen regimes? Which of those historical experiments succeeded? Which failed? And why? What are the structural factors that strengthen or weaken citizen government? How has institutional innovation in successful democracies addressed threats and opportunities of changing scale and technological change? How do democratic values relate to the necessary and sufficient conditions for democratic government? Well, obviously the list could be extended, but you get the idea. American higher education needs to include higher civic education. Now, the good news is that here at Stanford, discussions are now going on about instituting a mandatory civics course that would be a key part of a revised first year curriculum. Many questions remain about content and pedagogy. I've been adv advocating this for the last four years, and it looks as if it may come about. Stay tuned. Of course, there will be vigorous fights over what the course will actually look like. But we need to go beyond just one course. Stanford and other universities must be offering our future leaders and our citizens a chance to develop, delve more deeply into the history, the philosophy, the practice of citizen-centered regimes of civic leadership. 
We need courses in philosophy. We need courses in political history, political economy. And these must not be ideological. They must offer space for free and open debate across a wide range of political positions. We can do that. Some of us are working to make it possible. But it ought not to be a niche concern of a few concerned academics. It can and should be integrated into the core mission of the university. It's not too much to say that the future of our democratic republic hangs, at least in part, on the question of whether institutions of higher education will live up to their traditional duty to take a central role in educating citizens. Well, <clears throat> on that one, I, I would just say <laughs> the question we're here to discuss, uh, thank you uh, both, but what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be an American? Very, very highly relevant topic today uh, in a worrisome time when many are questioning the assumptions and values that have held together this multi-ethnic, multi-religious, uh, multi-racial society. And my path to understanding many of the unifying factors came from engagements I had with non-Americans over the years. Uh, we just heard in school we were exposed, uh, I think that's probably the best word, only exposed to uh, many of our revolutionary roots, our founding principles, and certainly our nation's shortcomings are highlighted. Uh, and each generation's efforts to improve what I would call our experiment in democracy. And Winston Churchill, as you know, likened democracy to the worst form of government, except for all the rest that humankind had tried on this planet. But that is what America is. It's a great big experiment. It's an experiment to determine if a government of the people, by the people, for the people, can long endure. And 80 years after our nation's birth, uh, in the effort to resolve the birth defect we had of slavery, Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg Century, uh, Cemetery put it this way. He said, we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. And we have come, he said, to dedicate a portion of that nation as a final resting place for those who died here that the nation might live. Uh, I was, even with my gray hair, I was not alive at that uh, speech. Uh, so if you fast forward to 1969 when I was coming of age and I was 18 in my freshman year, of college, both the Cold War and the Vietnam War uh, were ongoing, and the draft loomed very large uh, in the minds of all the young men in those days. And facing that reality, uh, I joined the Marines, uh, determined to do my three years of my patriotic duty, and returning swiftly to civilian status. By the way, I was going to become a teacher, uh, teach physics and history, and coach football. I had my whole life planned. And you've heard the Yiddish saying that uh, you make your plans and God laughs. Uh, and he laughed, he got a real good laugh out of my plan, I guarantee you. But why did I remain over four decades in the US military as an infantry officer? And I assure you it was not because I liked all the jobs. I grew to dislike intensely uh, minefields at a very young age. Uh, it was not the job, quite simply, I grew to love the young sailors and Marines I was with in the infantry platoon, young men who would bite their lips and crawl stoically into minefields, probing, looking for something they did not want to find, knowing it would kill their buddy if they didn't find it. And those are the young people who to this day sign blank checks payable to everybody in this room uh, with their lives to protect the freedoms and uphold the Constitution. And I was not in the Marine Corps for 43 years. I was in the US Marine Corps, accountable to all of you. And it was there that I came face to face with the military's role in forming citizens for our nation. I came face to face with citizens and non-citizens uh, that I likely would not have met had I not met them in the military. They came from all corners of our country, actually all corners of the globe. Uh, they were from all ethnicities, races, religions that make up this wonderfully diverse country. Uh, they were from rich and poor backgrounds, young men and women from cities, suburbs, or rural areas, 
young people with every opportunity handed to them on a silver platter, and those who grew up, grew up with few opportunities. But they all had dreams. And so they were sons of senators and CEOs and young men who grew up poor or having never even known their father. And I didn't just meet them. Uh, I got to know them as well as my own brothers. And sometimes even more than knowing them, we depended on one another for our lives. And so friendships were forged under the toughest, most grueling circumstances and circumstances that removed the differences between us, completely removed them and revealed the common humanity. It opened doors to understanding that made the harsh demands of life in the military in the infantry seem like cheap tuition for what I learned about myself and about our country and citizenship in its most raw form. As a 21-year-old second lieutenant commanding an infantry platoon of 40 young sailors and marines, it's called infantry for a reason, infant soldier, young soldier, they're named for how young they are. Uh, the most critical person in a platoon like that is your senior enlisted man. And in those days, we were hurting for NCOs because of the Vietnam War. And my first three senior enlisted guys were the ones who take young lieutenants under their arm and say, I know what you were trained back in Quantico about there, Lieutenant, and now I'm going to help you on your next level of training. My first was young Corporal Wayne Johnson, 22 years old, a citizen of the British West Indies. Uh, my second one was Corporal Manuel Rivera, citizen of Mexico. My third, Staff Sergeant Remy Lebrun of Quebec, citizen of Canada. You see, immigrants, children of immigrants, and lawful permanent residents served at higher rates than native-born Americans, and my first years in the fleet brought that home to me in very human terms because the person I relied on most to teach a young infantry lieutenant his grim skills were all non-citizens in my first two years in the Fleet Marine Force. And many a time over the next four decades, I would attend swearing ceremonies when soldiers, sailors, airmen, coast guardsmen, and marines proudly wearing their US military uniforms swore the oath of allegiance taken by all who wish to become US citizens. Here's what that oath says. I'm going to read it to you. I hereby declare on oath that I absolutely and entirely renounce and abjure all allegiance and fidelity to any foreign prince, potentate, state, or sovereignty of whom or of which I have heretofore been a subject or citizen, that I will support and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I will bear arms on behalf of the United States when required by the law. That I will perform non-combatant service in the armed force of the United States when required by the law. That I will perform work of national importance under civilian direction when required by the law. And that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, so help me God. I've seen tough Marines, ladies and gentlemen, veterans of many battles, take this oath with tears in their eyes, tears that some native-born Americans who take our freedoms for granted have difficulty understanding or empathizing with. I remember on board ship at dawn one day in the South China Sea with my platoon. And our ship, we spotted a decrepit boat overladen with refugees. As we approached, they could only see the bow of our ship coming straight on to them. And through binoculars, we could see the fear and apprehension on their faces as they stared at us. As we slowed and turned to come alongside to render aid, those on board saw the American flag. Cheering and waving, hugging each other, they taught this young lieutenant and his sailors and Marines what American citizenship meant to others. That they knew they could trust us. Some 35 years later, as a general, I was having lunch in Washington, D.C. with a very sophisticated foreign ambassador. And he educated me about post-World War II America, a country that made, as he described it, the single most self-sacrificial pledge in world history. He said, after World War II, you could have sold Europe that twice in 25 years you've dragged us into one of your wars. 
We're through with you. You're on your own. We're turning to Asia and Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East for our markets. You deal with the Soviet army. He said, instead, you pledged 100 million dead Americans in a nuclear war to protect democracy in Europe. That's what he thought this sophisticated ambassador represented America's citizenship as they looked at the world along the lines of what Karen was talking about earlier. Now, I'd had American history classes in school, but it took foreigners to teach me why so many look to America and its citizens for reassurance in troubled times. They educated me on what responsibilities our imperfect country citizens have carried out in the past. So looking back, what all did I learn from Marines of all races and creeds at sea and on foreign shores in combat so severe it could scrape off the veneer of civilization from every one of us? From refugees on an overcrowded leaking boat in the Pacific and from hundreds of other events, large and small. What I learned from all this in terms of our military's role in, in terms of forming citizens is this that America doesn't have to be perfect to be worth loving, supporting, and defending, that there are rhythms in life and in a country's life, that so long as each generation commits to the founding principles that our wonderfully imperfect country professes to stand for, that so long as a team, even under the worst sort of stress, keeps faith in each other, then our experiment in democracy's future remains in our hands and makes legitimate calls for our support because I saw the microcosm of America every day in the Marines, and even when fighting for life, I saw the best of America keeping faith in the goodness of each other. Faith that even in the crucible of combat, America and what its citizens stand for are worth fighting for, even when we're not perfect, because we share a passion to be always improving as citizens of this country, to fix what's broken, to never be complacent, and most importantly, to turn over to the next generation the same freedoms that we enjoy. I want to close with a quote because I believe that a country like ours is like a bank. You have to put something in if you want to take something out. As I said in the video, if you want freedom, you need to commit something. And oftentimes, collegians can say something to members of their college, alumni, graduates, that resonate to one another simply because of the shared formative experience. So here, is what one Yale alum said to Yale grads in 1940, a very dark time for democracy worldwide, facing a muscular and at that point wholly victorious fascist enemy. Walter Lippmann said, you took the good things for granted, now you must earn them again. For every right that you cherish, you have a duty which you must fulfill. For every hope that you entertain, you have a task that you must perform. For every good that you wish to preserve, you will have to sacrifice your comfort and your ease. There is nothing for nothing any longer. So I think Walter Lippmann's words uh, still are applicable to citizens today of this big experiment, and I think they're worth considering. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. <clears throat> We now have time for conversation, questions, discussion, and I'm going to prime the pump here by uh, asking each of our speakers a, uh, a question, drawing out of their talks. They do not know uh, what they're going to be asked. We'll find out if they know what the answer is. Um, and then um, I, I hope you'll be thinking of questions you would like to put to, uh, to them and uh, be lining up uh, behind these microphones so you can ask. Uh, please try to keep your questions as brief as I'm going to keep mine. I'm going to begin with Chiron. Your, um, your words were profound, but also a little pessimistic. I felt a little sadder uh, at the end, I, uh, <laughs> maybe. Than, and my question to you is, what is the greatest source of optimism that you see in the world or the United States today uh, about a revival of good citizenship? That's actually a hard question, and I think um, your discussion helps me um, think about the more um, optimistic side of citizenship in America. We probably wouldn't have the kind of debate that we're having now about global citizenship 
if we had civics education. Um, because much of what's being debated now is just a violation of some of the basic understandings about, of how nations organize themselves, um, about the history of citizenship. Uh, much of it is a, about, um, I think, trying to make us more moral. And um, part of the argument is we have such a responsibility to others, to the environment, to the degradation that we've seen, to stopping war, that if we do something different with people, we'll get better outcomes. But first of all, I think we need to understand first principles and who we are and how we got here. And I think that ties all of our presentations together. And if we return to the kind of education, it doesn't have to be one that we did in the past, but where we do teach the West, where we do teach the cl classics and include them in our, our standard curricula, I think we'll see a very different debate. Global citizenship is not the way to make the world more moral, to make people more moral, um, and it, because it doesn't really address the issue of the hard work, the responsibility that we face on a daily basis of being part of a polity. So I think there is some positives to really starting with the fundamental problem of K through 16. If we address that, I think we have a different conversation. And what Hoover's doing here is our way of contributing to a more moral education. So Josh, let me ask you this. Um, uh, you mentioned the founders of this country, Chiron did, <laughs> Jim did, I did too. Um, uh, but I often hear from young people, from students, uh, why are we talking about those guys? They, uh, uh, they epitomize for many people, many young people today, you know, a white male uh, privilege. They are what we should be, we're, we sh that's what we should be casting aside to create a new, more egalitarian uh, uh, world. What do you say to those people? I want to say that their worries are not meaningless, they're not empty. Um, uh, our country has had a, a deep problems um, <coughs> with race, obviously slavery. Um, uh, so that it's not an empty concern that they have. But I think leaping to the thought that because people have a certain ethnicity, had a certain um, class standing, um, had a certain formation, <coughs> that those, the ideas that those people had um, or have, um, uh, that the form of government that they devised um, is somehow inherently corrupt, um, uh, uh, is um, uh, just because it is born with defects, um, that it is so defective as to be um, uh, uh, subject to being completely rejected. So what I hope to do in my teaching um, uh, is not to convince people that there is um, a perfect union that was created at a single moment at the 18th century and somehow we've fallen short of that, or that the classics that the founders read, the Greek and Roman classics, are um, uh, the unique exemplars um, of a kind of um, ethics, of a kind of morality, um, and that returning to them is the only way to go forward. And yet, if we don't understand the background, the grounding from which the impulse to say that I care about justice, um, I care about equality. Um, uh, I care about uh, the liberty um, that is being, to some extent, violated by incarceration. Um, uh, that finding out where those ideas came from initially, how they've been developed over time, how they were built into a constitutional order, how that was done in different 
democratic experiments over time, not only our 18th century one, but um, uh, early war ones and now subsequent ones. That's going to be important for them to then finally make their own judgment about how can whatever promise there is um, in a democracy be fulfilled in the age we live in. I'm not going to go back to the 18th century, um, and yet uh, the foundation um, of the fundamental values um, of freedom, of equality, of dignity, and the conception that there are certain baseline conditions that are necessary to sustain those values, those ideas were in fact um, uh, originated then or instantiated then. Um, and we can build on that, I think, to build indeed a more perfect union, never a perfect one. Um, and yet, as Jim said, um, it's an ongoing experiment. We can do better. And I think I'd like to say to them, that's what you're really asking for, that we do do better. So, General, as I heard you talking, it seemed to me there was that one of the themes of your, uh, of your words are, are so similar to what many at the founding uh, believed uh, about the importance of self-sacrifice for the common good, that, um, that good citizenship and patriotism, patriotism in particular, love of country, is not based upon uh, the, the blessings and privileges that we enjoy from the nation as much as it is based upon the sacrifices that we make for the nation. So my question to you is, you know, outside of the military, when you look at, you've come now to Stanford, um, one of the most privileged places on the planet, right? Um, and uh, you, you see the society that we are in and that our students are in, where is the source of self-sacrifice uh, in a society like that? Where is the source? Right, what kind of, if self-sacrifice is important to citizenship, to, to yeah. patriotism as I think you have perceived, um, where does it come from uh, in, a, in, in our very privileged domestic society? Well, I think it starts, uh, Mike, with a, with a sense of gratitude uh, for all that we're giving and an awareness of that. And it's hard to have that when you're young and you grow up with something, you just sense, oh, it's always been there. It's like oxygen, you just get to breathe it. But as we heard, our education system is probably not putting a premium on showing people how fortunate they are. I had to see many of our privileges and all of our benefits of democracy, oftentimes through other people's eyes who did not have those benefits. And I think if we could bring even a dozen students from Hong Kong right now to the Stanford campus and let them walk around and say what it's like when you don't have it, that's when you really notice it. You know, most of us in this room were born here completely by accident. All of us live here by choice. But we have a responsibility to the next generation to turn over those freedoms intact and the country a little bit better. We hold. Jefferson used this word, and I never say it when I've had more than one beer. Um, <laughs> we hold this country in usufruct. I had to go look it up. But basically, he was an agrarian, as you know, and you can, you can chop down the trees, you can change the course of the streams, you can plow the ground, you do whatever you want with it. But you must turn it over to your daughter or son in as good or better condition than you've got it. We hold this country in usufruct. It's not about making a sacrifice per se, it's carrying out your duty to the next generation and not being so selfish that, that you think that you can just spend money by borrowing it, that you can just you know, do whatever you want to the, to, the, uh, to the environment without taking care of it. You've got to turn it over in as good a shape or better. That's a responsibility and that source that is the source to me for everything you do and why I don't feel at all like I was a martyr by going out and serving in the infantry for 40 years. I'll look you right in the eye right now and I've never met you and I'll tell you every one of you was worth every day of it. 
I don't care who you voted for. I don't care if you're male or female. I don't care whether you go to the church or the mosque, the synagogue or the saloon on Sunday or Friday, whatever. Mm -hmm. You're worth it. You know, that's what freedom's all about. But we've got to continue this trajectory toward always trying to make it a fairer, more just society. And that doesn't stop at the water's edge. Our example is, is what's motivating many of the kids in Hong Kong right now to stay the course against a pretty onerous, uh, a pretty onerous bunch. So I think it's more a responsibility than it is a sense of just going for self-sacrifice. There's always been enough patriots to step forward, and God willing, there will always be them. But we all need to roll up our sleeves and try to keep this country on that trajectory. That's a responsibility. Do I see a question here? And please don't be shy about coming forward. Hi, uh, hi. I'm, a, I'm a young voter and citizen. And uh, given this, the vast wisdom on the stage here, the, um, my concise question to you is, what in the next year or two scares you? Um, I read things in the news, I mean, as early as last week or this ongoing, you know, the things in Iran and obviously with China and North Korea. And there's a lot of noise going on. And I'm still trying to piece it all together. Like what scares, there's so much noise. I want to know what scares you specifically, given all the, not the models that you've, you've had from your experiences when you look at these things. Who wants to take that on? The, the question was, what scares us? So what scares yeah, yeah. you? So let's say this year, within the next two years, what scares you? I'll tell you one of the things that scares me is uh, when I hear candidates from both of the great parties of this country talking about silly stuff and not addressing things that really matter to the country. Let me, let me add something there. I was a Secretary of Defense, and most of you know what that means. You know, you're supposed to defend the country. Uh, right now, uh, there, there are threats. We're concerned about the North Koreans, missiles, and nuclear weapons, and that sort of thing, and Russia's bellicose rhetoric and invading countries. We have terrorism. It's an ambient threat. It's out there. How do we protect without losing our constitutional freedoms, uh, overreact to it? What scares me worse than any external threat is how Americans are treating each other right now in public life. That our enemies, I mean, if we don't get back, if we don't get back to showing some fundamental respect, to listening to one another, to showing a degree of friendliness toward one another. I mean, I've fought terrorists for a long time. I know what terrorists look like. When I hear somebody in public life calling a fellow American a terrorist it's because they have a different idea about how to address a problem. That worries me more than the Russian army, I guarantee you. So I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. just, shall we take another question? Uh, I've been to a few different countries, and of the countries I've been to, the one that most uh, biggest culture shock was actually Switzerland. I remember <laughs> seeing everybody seemed genuinely invested in making their country a better place. Uh, at road construction projects, people were literally, everyone was literally working, not just holding up a sign or something. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, they have a different immigration policy. They have mandatory military service. What do you think it would take for us to get our citizenry towards uh, what Switzerland has uh, embodied that's realistic to get everybody on board with? Josh, you're probably closer to Switzerland than the rest of us. Switzerland has a very interesting history. Um, uh, as you may know, some of the cantons uh, of Switzerland were actually exemplars of direct democracy, um, that uh, they have a tradition of citizens not only uh, engaging in the kind of work that General Mathis is talking about, uh, military service, not only voting, um, but going to a community gathering in which they're deciding the basic rules and decisions about their local community. So I think that one of the things that could get us back is thinking about ways in which we can take our tradition of American federalism and making it more real, making what we do locally um, uh, more engaged and then more connected to what we do nationally so that you can feel that as a citizen, 
that you actually have a voice um, and that you can use that voice to at least make some or help make some or contribute to making uh, local decisions and that those local decisions have an in integrated uh, role to play in the larger community, the national community of which you are a part. And that's going to take some serious thinking about institutional design. It's basically stepping up federalism to a 20th century level or 21st century level. Exactly how to do that is the challenge, and that's a challenge that I hope that your generation is going to take on. Um, there's also the issue of chocolate. Um, <laughs> But, uh, a question over here. <laughs> um, General Mathis, you, you said that, uh, among other things, that one of the keys to citizenship is trust. And that's trust in each other as citizens and trust in the government. So my question for all of you is, is trust teachable? Is it trainable? And how badly has social media, our political polarization, and the thousands of fact-check demonstrated fibs of our current mm -hmm. president eroded trust, and to what do we need to do to rebuild it? Um, I, I would, uh, it's a great question. Uh, there's a, the senior Marine on campus here is not the retired four star, it's the retired captain, George Schultz. Um, and Secretary Schultz will tell you that in all factors dealing with human interaction, engagement, trust is what he calls the coin of the realm. Uh, it starts, I think, with, with, uh, at, at home, obviously, but I think civic education is where you can actually put a, uh, a, a, a strong rationale together for why without trust you cannot have a functioning democracy. Because if you can't trust one another, why would you be willing to have others with, with power, basically? And yet, you've got to, in a community, give power to some people. You, you hire a policeman. You, you give authority to the mayor to distribute the, t the town's money. How can you have this work if you don't have trust? So you, you can train to it. Uh, you can actually put people in uh, difficult circumstances where they have to trust one another. Uh, that's why we seem to come together a lot more, I think, during a crisis. You remember right after 9-11, we had all pulled together. But uh, we shouldn't have to wait for that. This is in our best interest to work with one another. It's the only way to work with one another is to trust each other. And I'm not sure at times why people don't trust because I've found, I forget who it was, he, he said it's harder to trust somebody once you've met them. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, it, you know it's, uh, it, reverse it is the way I would put it, okay? Once you meet people, it's also harder to hate them, okay? so. Best I can give you. I, I don't have a good answer for you. I've seen trust work, though. Right now, for example, we have excellent trusted relations between the U.S. military and the Mexican military. Now, you might wonder, considering some of the rhetoric that you've heard, how could we have that? And the fact is, by, by both military's estimate, uh, right now, we have established that kind of trust. So I've seen it work, even when other things were going wrong or were difficult. So it's just a matter of rolling up your sleeves and living up to your word. When you give your word, they got to know you're there. Now, I'd like to throw that question to Chiron, too, that very excellent question. I have a feeling you might have some interesting thoughts about it. So I'm of a couple minds. I think um, I do agree with the term that Schultz has used, that trust is the coin of the realm, and you can't run a government without it. Um, having been in Washington, I've seen recently that not only is there, it's not just trust that Americans um, lack for their own government, but somehow, and I think most of the problems we're talking about here are K through 16 problems. Um, we have moved so far in a transactional direction where almost every engagement mm -hmm especially in Washington, is about what will this do for me very, very quickly. Um, and so trust is not a factor when you're dominated by transactions. Um, how we fix that, I don't know. But there should be in a democracy a healthy distrust of government always. Um, and so when I read 
you know, polls show that only 40% of Americans trust this or that branch of government or the whole government. There's nothing, I think, in our founding that suggests that we should give over our cognitive abilities and our ability to rival hypothesize to um, elected or unelected government officials. But knowing how to do that responsibly, I think is a huge problem now. Um, so on the one side, I distrust my government because I should, and the whole founding of our country, the writing of the Constitution um, was about how do we figure out um, an institutional arrangement given that we're dealing with fallible human beings. Um, but on the other side, we need political officials who aren't transactional, but that's the, the period that we're in. And if you fix that, you fix a lot of problems. Uh, first, thank you to all the speakers for your comments this evening. Um, a common theme I heard was a desire to have voluntary participation of our citizenry in our democracy, in our great experiment. Uh, for you, General Mattiser, what what are your thoughts on what we may gain through obligatory service, either military or other, or what we might, uh, the opportunity might lose by remaining to hope and, and try to have this voluntary participation? Well, I mean, there's a strong argument to be made that if Abraham Lincoln and Woodrow Wilson and FDR and John F. Kennedy could all call American to be conscripted, why don't we do it today? Why don't we force the issue? Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm from the West. I've studied the Mormon. I'm not Mormon, but I've studied the Mormon. This expectation that young men and now young women uh, will become missionaries for two years. For two years, they will do something for someone else. And I think it's a lot uh, more in keeping with the American tradition that we would call on people of all ages, but certainly young people coming of age and then retirees or people who want to take a time out from their job to just do something for someone else. Put others first for a year or two. I don't care if it's teaching in a, in a poor school district, poor, poor, you know, poorly functioning school district uh, on a Native American reservation or in an inner city or it's in the Peace Corps or the Marine Corps. I don't care where it's at. But again, uh, create a tradition here that instead of in Europe back in the interwar period, all the young people took a year on the continent to tour and I guess find themselves, which I don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> but I think it'd be a lot better for us to look at it and say, why don't we spend, just as a natural course, a year or two doing things for others and, and create as a national expectation something that could be part of civic education that this is what you do when you can. But I'm, I don't think putting a government bureaucracy in place that would somehow legis uh, you know, run something like this, I, I don't think it would be the most effective way to get where we want to go, which is basically a sense of love for their fellow citizens and for the other people in the world that, they, that it, it becomes operant. If, does that answer your question or did it I does, beat around the sir. bush? Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I was uh, really moved, General, when you talked about uh, soldiers and sailors taking their oath and how you recounted their feelings as they were mm -hmm. um, making this pledge. Um, we also, so my question is about oaths and affirmative uh, acts towards citizenship. Professor Ober, you've studied ancient Greece and public citizens, those who would take civic office, would take a pledge to leave their cities and states better than when they found them. And we still have that tradition of public servants taking an oath. Mm -hmm. To my understanding today, there is no oath to global citizenship. And we no longer practice this daily pledge of allegiance to our flag, which was once also a part of our civic education in elementary schools. Could you talk a bit about the act, the performative act of oaths and of pledging towards an affirmative way towards our citizenship? Does it matter anymore? I'll take a stab at it. I, I know that it means a lot in the military. I mean, it, you're reminded of it. 
uh, routinely, sometimes in rather brusque terms by a sergeant. Um, but, uh, but also when you re-enlist, when you're promoted, you take the oath again, you raise your right hand, you swear the military oath again to uphold and defend the Constitution, support and defend the Constitution. And I think that uh, it's got to be something where the community makes it a, a uh, kind of a symbols clash in your life. You know, you'd go into the opera, and not that I do that often, it'd ruin my image. <laughs> but, but I do go, okay, and then the symbols go, you know, especially if you've gotten a little sleepyhead after a long day at work. Some, and I think it's got to be like the symbols clash that brings you back. I said, oh, yeah, I remember I'm part of something bigger than me. I'm responsible for them, not just me. You know, it kind of brings you out of your, your me-ism, you know. But I think uh, it's got to be voluntary or it's meaningless. Like it said, I take this, uh, the, the, you know, I take this obligation freely and without any mental, mental reservation or purpose of evasion. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be willing. It, it can't be forced. You know. Josh, what? Well, at least one way to think about it uh, is that naturalized citizens um, are required to take an exam um, and pass an exam, yeah. and then take an oath. By the accident of having been born here, um, I didn't have to do that. Is that right? Um, should we at least think about um, whether uh, those who choose, and I think exactly right, it must be voluntary, mm -hmm. to take on the duties of citizenship, including the duties of voting, of um, uh, sitting in judgment of, on uh, a, a jury, to take on those duties, perhaps I ought to have made the act um, of committing myself to some kind of a oath of citizenship. And those who didn't want to do that could be residents, could have passports, um, could have all of the various background things that allows you to live um, a life as a effective um, uh, uh, member of a society, and yet short of being mm -hmm. a full citizen. I mean, at least that would suggest to us mm -hmm. the seriousness of mm -hmm. this duty um, that I think uh, we've all been stressing that mm -hmm. is connected to the rights um, that come with um, uh, the status um, of being a citizen. So I think at least it's worth thinking about. Um, at least it's worth putting that into the conversation. Um, do I, because of the accident of my birth, have no responsibility at all to make the kind of commitment mm -hmm. that someone who is born by accident um, uh, someplace else um, is required to do? Um, if, so if this I, excellent question, we all want to jump in. So <laughs> Yeah, um, on the issue of taking oaths, um, you will be interested to know that, of course, you have to take an oath of office when you're Senate confirmed. But there are um, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of positions when a new administration comes in that aren't Senate confirmed. And you still take an oath. Mm -hmm. And some people are taking an oath every year if they switch jobs. And often it is the cabinet official or his or her um, designee who um, does the oath. and. I have found that taking an oath repeatedly doesn't make you do a better job. It doesn't make you a better citizen. It has to be part of a broader understanding of the responsibilities of citizenship. But by itself, it's not enough. But we have a lot of oath taking in the US. Someone or somebody is taking an oath every single day. Um, and we're still having the outcomes that, that concern us all. Hi, uh, uh, Professor Ober. Uh, so I was trained at an engineer at Stanford, but m the course I enjoyed the most throughout my time here was your course on the origins of political thought, where you covered you know, the, the Peloponnesian War, the early Greek city-states. And the part that remains with me after all these years is I was always curious about the decline of Athenian democracy. So how does society, known for its republicanism, its advanced democracy for its time, 
um, abandon these principles. And in, if a common refrain I get from this panel is that citizenship is under attack. And if so, what is in the, in, in the Hoover Institution's motto, what is the marketplace of ideas that are competing against it? So if, if, if everybody agrees that citizenship is at risk, what is the competing idea in opposition to citizenship do people find attractive and why have we failed structurally to make citizenship an attractive option for the past decades in, in society and in office? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I mean, I think the simple answer to the question of what happened to Athenian democracy is that the Athenians failed to find an institutional answer finally after 200 years of success uh, as a democracy. They failed to find the answer of um, how to address the problem of scale. They simply were not able or not willing, um, not didn't find the breakthrough way of conceiving of themselves to expand their citizenship um, beyond the core of native adult males of Athenian territory. And in the end, they were overwhelmed by larger entities that were able to bring military pressure to bear that they simply didn't have the resources, the human resources, to answer. So scale really is the challenge of democracy. Um, scale in terms of numbers, scale in terms of the distance between people, the diversity. So a successful democracy answers those questions, figures out how to become bigger and more diverse without losing the coherence of citizenship, of a citizen community. That's really hard. The Athenians didn't succeed in doing that. I think arguably we're facing a similar kind of moment of can we do that? Do we have a way to confront the 21st century challenges of scale, whether we think of it as global citizenship or um, uh, a diversity um, in ways that are going to be genuinely innovative and will allow us to be a community of citizens together that is larger and more diverse in various ways. The alternative to citizenship is being a subject, right? That's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, to have a master, to have a boss, um, uh, to have someone who can give you orders to which you have no response. Um, uh, and uh, if your boss is benevolent, um, uh, has the best interest in the community um, uh, in mind, you may have a perfectly nice life. Um, uh, so that's the alternative, and many people find it very attractive. Of course, the boss may choose then not to be so benevolent. Um, the next leader uh, may not be so benevolent. You may start out with Augustus and end up with Caligula. That's a little bit rough, but that's just the choice you make from giving up citizenship and choosing to be a subject. But I think that really is the choice. They're really, it's, it's binary. Either citizens govern themselves or they accept the governance of someone else or um, some other uh, junta or coalition. So I have a slightly different reaction to the question of what is the uh, alternative. And in 1774, Patrick Henry electrified uh, the country when he stood up at the Continental Congress and he said, I am not a Virginian, I am an American. At a time when you know, primary citizenship, primary loyalty was still in your individual place. I am an American. He said those were the alternatives. And I think that today we are similarly seeing a kind of reverse Patrick Henryization of, uh, uh, of America in which um, people's primary loyalty is breaking up into various kinds of tribalism. You know, for some people, this is division along the lines of, of, of race, sex, sexuality, and so forth. I, identity politics, I think, is a, is a, is a part of this. I, I also think that the biggest, 
most dangerous, most vicious identity that is becoming coming to the fore uh, in America is actually political partisanship. And the, the sign of these things becoming uh, dangerous is when people love to hate folks of the other side. You know, so that it isn't just that I could take, take pride in, you know, like being a Presbyterian, um, if one can take pride in being a Presbyterian, which I seriously doubt most days, but uh, it's, that, it's that one senses that, that other members of other factions are uh, stupid, hateful, uh, uh, racist, uh, you know, privileged, whatever it happens to be, uh, and this divides the country and I think makes people not citizens of the nation, but rather in a sense citizens of their own uh, particular uh, identity politics, and I think that is tearing the country apart. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm part of the youngest generation here at Stanford. The sort of seminal historical events for me growing up were the Great Recession, the War on Terror, NSA surveillance, the rise of social media. And it seems to me that not just knowledge, but trust in American values and rights and liberties are something that need to continually be renewed, not just for new generations, but also internationally. I was wondering your perspective on uh, our duty and obligation as citizens and residents of this country, uh, as opposed to perhaps uh, the state or leaders or the educational system in terms of renewing this trust? Mm -hmm. Well, the, I think the trust question really does keep coming back, doesn't it? Uh, I think there really are, once again, if we think about this in a very binary kind of way, the question is, is do we see those who are other than ourselves, um, uh, those who have goals that are to some extent different from ours among our fellow citizens as our enemies, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's what uh, some theorists have advocated. Um, the German theorist uh, Carl Schmitt suggested that the basic meaning of politics was the relationship of friend and enemy. Um, and that when politics got real, uh, it was a matter of identifying your enemy and destroying them. So uh, he was uh, uh, sometimes called Hitler's jurist. Um, uh, the alternative is, is what Aristotle called civic friendship. Uh, civic friendship isn't a personal friendship. Um, you don't have to love your fellow citizens. And yet, you do believe in them as people who are part of the same extended project. You accept that we have some goals in common, and we cannot achieve those goals unless we recognize that commonality and act um, uh, accordingly. So I think part of it is a, a, a the, the problem of trust is getting back to this basic Aristotelian conception of civic friendship, reconstructing it for the 21st century. It's not just going back and reading Aristotle carefully, although that's a very good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, thank you for the shout out uh, earlier for the uh, course in which we do do that. Um, uh, but I think thinking about that, uh, uh, thinking about uh, the way that you trust someone as a civic friend, um, uh, as a sharer in certain core goals and a necessary participant in gaining those goals is what we've got to go for. Once again, how to do that under the conditions of the 21st century, um, social media and so on, is the next big challenge. Um, and it can't be just people of my age who are going to do that because we don't have the skills. Um, uh, and uh, that is really, I think, um, your generation's challenge um, is stepping up to how can you find a way to be friends with those um, with whom you have profound disagreements. 
I want to first thank all of you for such a great discussion. This is so important, and I just want to say thank you. I have a, a couple quick comments, but then into my question. First of all, um, I want to encourage if Stanford takes this on to delve into you know civics and so on. Um, there's a college, a little college called Hillsdale College. And you might look at that because um, they have an online course. I just want to be, encourage you. They have an online course called The Constitution and Civics 101. Anyway, it's, it's spanning across the country. And people are taking their online courses, over a million or two million people. So be encouraged. People will snap this up. And I think um, they have study groups. People can do it you know, singly, but I think Stanford's um, course would be well received. So my point is get it online as soon as you can so that people can take it from all over, you know, the world, frankly. The second thing is um, I, I thought you might find it interesting that in Israel, say, three, four years ago, they were pondering how could they get their people to assimilate, you know what I mean? Get on the same page. All these people returning from all over the world. Like how could they um, get their people to think about the country more, be engaged and so on? And they decided that the best way to do it was to have the people study their history. So they um, started a 929 class which it wasn't a class, they were having everyone read a chapter a day because there are 929 chapters in the Bible. This would be the Old Testament. But I thought you'd find that encouraging that that was what their solution was, get the people to read their history. And so let that be a lesson to all of us that that we study our history, you know, the history of the United States. But now, now my question. My question has to do with the Constitution. Um, I'm concerned, and I wonder if you can comment on this, like how there's all this talk and rhetoric about um, changing the Constitution, and let's throw out the Second Amendment or throw out the First Amendment and so on. How, why is it that the rhetoric is all about changing. The, it just seems in my lifetime, it's, it's say the last 10, 10 or 15 years, more than when I was a, you know, a child, teenager or whatever, that there's more talk about changing the Constitution instead of adhering to it. I don't know whether I'm articulating the question properly, but I think you get the gist of you know, how there's all this discussion that we want to change it, change it, change it. And I'm just wondering what your comments are about the Constitution, adhering to that as our foundation. So if you, if you look through American history, the, uh, there, are more, there are periods of more sort of agitation to change the Constitution, and then it goes down and it sort of it, it you know, rises and falls. I do think that we are currently at a time when many more people are entertaining the thought. And it's, it's simply a way, because the Constitution is so important to the way we do things, when things don't seem to be going well, naturally people think, well, maybe that means that there's something that our, you know, our, our foundational uh, uh, system, maybe we can solve our problems by, uh, by looking uh, back uh, at that. Uh, when you press people for what particular changes there would be to the Constitution, of course people say things like, well, abolish the uh, uh, electoral college or, or, you know, or, or, or guns or, or various things that are essentially peripheral issues. But I don't actually, at least my experience is that uh, most people, for most people it's sort of generalized to satisfaction rather than an actual belief in that, that we need to change the, the, the way the Republic does things. Mike, I'm sorry, but we're, we've reached the witching hour. I want to thank you all for a wonderful conversation. Can you join me? <laughs>
And I, and I want to thank all of you who have come tonight to participate. I believe there's a reception in the uh, lobby outside. Please stay for that. We look forward to seeing you out there. And we look forward to seeing you at our next speaker event. Thank you very much.